Welcome back to the Herb Rally Podcast. Today, I'm excited to welcome on for the second time, Tad Hargrave with marketingforhippies.com. Welcome to the show, Tad. Thanks. Good to be back. Yeah. Smoky herbal blends. We need some mullin and some kush, my brethren. While listening to Herb Rally Podcast again. Herbalism at its finest with Mason Hutchinson. Yeah. I'm really excited to have you back. You know, we had such a great conversation last time. And for those of you, dear listener, if you want to tune in and get to know a little bit more about Tad and his background, definitely check out the last episode we did. I'll be sure to leave a link to that in the YouTube description, podcast, show notes, etc. Um, so why don't we, as I was telling you, Tad, pre-call... This is going to be a little more of a Q&A based on some of the posts I've seen you do recently, both on your LinkedIn. By the way, dear listener, go follow Tad on his LinkedIn. He's always posting great stuff there, as well as some uh, videos on your your website and your uh, awesome YouTube channel as well. So um, I want to um, start with a fastball here, Tad, and really curious what your, your take on this is. Um, you're an expert in this. You're going to do great. So I'm just, I'm just really curious your thoughts on this. So... Herb Rally, which you're, you're now familiar with what we do here to some degree or another based on the last show, um, Herb Rally's mission is to create a community that encompasses the entire herbal community. And I know you're big on niching down. In fact, you recently came out with a video uh, titled, Which Belief Are You Most Afraid to Share? And I, I, I loved that video. I love that concept. And um, it almost feels as if Herb Rally and our mission is almost the opposite of niching down, opposite of being afraid of what you're sharing, what you're most afraid to share. Um, and I guess what I'm getting at is, am I, is, or not am I, is Herb Rally almost like an anti-niche? Are we trying to, is it odd that we're trying to include everybody? Uh, so for instance, one week we'll have a, a green witch, quote unquote, on the show. The next week we'll have a... Um, a Christian on the show. And my mission overall is to make sure everybody in the herbal community feels welcome. And not only that, but to get different POVs, different perspectives. Um, and it's always been my mission that way. And I feel like that's kind of how I live my life. But on the other hand, you could almost say that um, I'm trying to appeal to too many people. I'm trying, <laughs> am I taking a bold state, making a bold statement by including everybody, or am I just um, being too open? And I know that's a lot. I've been talking already more than I usually do in these shows, <laughs> but I'm just kind of curious. Does that make sense? What What's your take on that? Well, there are a few thoughts. Do you know what the word uh, depanel means? Say that again? Uh, depanel. Oh, no, I don't. It was a French word. It means corner store, basically. And uh, so in Quebec, you know, there's all these depanels that call them these corner stores. And the corner store has a little bit of everything. It's mm -hmm. got your bread, it's got your milk, it's got your, you know, spaghetti sauce, your, <laughs> your uh, soft drinks, cigarettes. It's kind of the staples that people might need on a day-to-day -day basis. So that is a niche. I mean, it's not that there's anything that isn't niched. Uh, the bigger question is just how's the niche working out for you? Yeah you know, for anyone, okay, you're doing this thing, is it attracting enough of the kind of clients and customers that you want? And if not, that's a problem. And if it is, it's great. So, you know, if it works, it works. Good point. So, so just generally, I would say that the, the community general store that seems not to have a niche that is in fact a, a vital niche in a community. Interesting. Um, second thing, is there's already, you know, there's, there's niching that happens whether we want to or not. You're a white dude with a beard, <laughs> yes. you know, and with a certain vibe yeah. that will appeal to some people and not appeal to other people. There are going to be people who are upset that you did or didn't speak out about what's happening in Palestine. Yep. And that polarizes, you know, so people that I've That's seen... True colleagues of mine saying, well, I don't want to, I'm not going to take a stance or a side on Palestine. And they get completely written off yeah. by people. And if they do take a stance, they get written off uh, by other people. 
so it's you're going to get written off by some people and so to me the thing is to proceed authentically and then let the chips fall where, where they may and there are almost always you know people will say well we want to be totally inclusive you know so you, you've got the left saying we want to be very inclusive of different points of view <laughs> okay not that um right, right. <laughs> or, or people will say uh you know, or people who are very racist and they're very inclusive within a certain milieu and then, oh, not with people of color. So the, there's almost always some parameters and some boundaries. And I just think it's probably better for us to be conscious of what those are, um, what's welcome, what's not welcome. Because sometimes even it's, well, everyone's welcome, but not everything is welcome. Everybody's welcome, but not every kind of behavior is welcome. Yeah. Um, not every worldview is entirely welcome. Uh, so sometimes we just have these parameters and until it appears, we don't even realize that, oh, there actually is a place where I finally say no. Um, yeah. and there are certain beliefs that are really important to me. And this is what I talk about the most. And so that's, what's going to draw some people in and turn some people off. I mean, I guarantee you there are people in the herbal community who will say, oh no, I don't listen to the herb rally podcast because X, Y, Z. Right. And it's just not for them. Um, and they would prefer, you know, something more politically radical, something more overtly spiritual. And they're like, oh, it's nice that he's out there, but it's just not where I go for my info because it's it's a little bit too broad. And other people, oh, my God, what a great sampler. This is so nice. To... Mm. So there, there's no getting around it. There's no the the, the myth of we're going to be we're going to try to get everybody. It just doesn't work in the real world. There's no such thing as. Nothing gets everybody because even if you say, well, we're here for everybody, the fact that you go for everybody makes you unappealing to certain people. Mm. You hit the nail on the head. Yeah, no, everything you said there definitely rings true. And, you know, come to think of it, I hate to admit it or maybe I don't, but uh, there, there are people thus far that I have actually denied being on the show. Um, and, and then I start to feel uncomfortable because I'm like, oh, am I censoring or this or that and i'm like well no it just doesn't align with what i'm trying to promote right now and uh part of me wants to lean into that and actually um actually have them on the show because something about it is making me feel uncomfortable um but at the same time yeah you're right in a in a roundabout way i, I suppose i am niching down and there's definitely people um for instance, we just posted a video with Robin Rose Bennett. It was titled um, Robin Rose Bennett's Definition of a Green Witch. And I looked at the um, subscriber count on our YouTube and it like clearly turned people off because we had a bunch of people unsubscribe. And um, it was just uh, interesting. I'm like, okay, yeah, this is definitely um, turning certain folks off. And uh, anyways, I just appreciate the thoughts and not sure if you have anything else to say, but I, I would like to perhaps have you delve further into, and maybe this isn't necessarily for Herb Rally specifically, but um, uh, go more in depth on which belief are you most afraid to share? Because I think that is probably really helpful for a lot of like, say, clinical herbalists out there that are listening to the show. Sure. So if we go back to that old story that a lot of us heard growing up of the emperor's new clothes. So, mm -hmm. right, the story goes, there's a king, and he wants to have the most fabulous garment and uh, somehow or another a tailor appears but the tailor uh, doesn't have anything so he says it's this invisible thread and does the most fantastic mime and because he's so convinced uh, and the king wants so deeply to believe this is happening sort of everyone just starts to believe this thing that's not true mm -hmm. that the there's this incredible gown and everyone pretends they can see a thing that doesn't actually exist. And of course the King very excited wants to parade this. And so puts on this <laughs> imaginary uh, frock and gets carried through town, totally naked. <laughs> uh, and everybody yeah. in town of course knows the story. So they're ooing an eye. Everybody has colluded in this lie. And finally as a kid, Hey, the king's naked, you know. <laughs> and everybody said, oh, yeah, well, I guess that is true. Yeah. And the spell's <clears throat> broken. So there, the, everyone was terrified to say the thing that was patently obvious to everybody. Everybody could see it, but nobody wanted to say it. And so 
if there are things that you feel very strongly that you're not saying because you're scared, to me, what that's an immediate indication of almost certainly is that you're not the only one mm. who is seeing it, yeah. but you might be the only one to say it. There are a lot of reasons. I mean, you know, we can all think of without having to name them overtly certain insanities that are happening in modern times that a lot of people notice and you would get canceled if you said it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, within any community, there are going to be these hypocrisies, these uh, falsehoods. You know, of course, uh, you know, in religion, there's there's a ton of these, the, the inconsistencies that happen. In uh, politics, there's mad inconsistencies of, uh, you know, politicians. But sometimes if it's, oh, but we really want that, I mean... <laughs> You got a great election going on down there in the states. Real top top tier people <laughs> if you're running. Um, but the uh, it's interesting to see, you know, people who would have vilified uh, Kamala Harris now supporting mm. and willing to turn a blind eye to certain parts of the history of, you know, particularly her. Uh, jailing of, of, you know, people over nonviolent drug related offenses, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and we can, we can do this with any politician, but when we really want to believe, because we really don't want it to be the other person, there's a willingness to turn a blind eye. Mm. And uh, when a lot of people do that, you get a kind of, um, there's a collusion that happens, but people feel it's a gaslighting that we are participating in. And if somebody's willing to just tell the truth and say, hey, what about this? There's an immense relief. I think we've all felt it where somebody finally just says the thing, names the elephant in the room that nobody's naming. It's shocking a little bit. It's you don't know how to react. And some part of you is so relieved of finally it's out in the open and we don't have to pretend anymore. This happens in families as well. The, the dark secrets, you know, there's often those scenes in the movie where finally somebody says the thing that's being hidden in the family. There's a big uproar. And then there's the scene afterwards, you know, towards the end where it's like, ah, finally we can breathe and talk to each other. And there's been this healing. So in the marketplace, there's this. And, and so one I noticed years ago that the most um, popular posts I ever did were rants. So it's a question I would invite everyone to consider is what's the bullshit that you are seeing in your own industry or community or scene? What's the stuff that's driving you crazy secretly and that you secretly gossip about with people? Mm -hmm. That's the thing you might consider sharing. Now, wow. that seems terrifying, but there's a few things to consider. First of all, you don't have to. I mean, there's some things that's probably better not to share given whatever's going on in your life. But... We often, the question we ask ourselves is, well, what's the worst that could happen if I share this? That's where the brain goes. But let's just linger at least for a second over, um, you know, what's the best that could happen? Mm -hmm. You know, what's the best that could happen if we share it? And I, I think of a colleague of mine, uh, Yana Hexter, who does, has a website, grantschampion.com, helps grant uh, with grant writing. And she really, for all the time I'd known her, had a mad frustration about the whole nonprofit industrial complex and the whole grant writing world and how it wastes people's time and everybody's waiting for a billionaire to save the, you know. And she she thought it, she, I've heard, it, heard her say it for years. And I'd say, you should share that. That's really compelling. And she finally did, but it took her years. She wrote an email where she just let loose a little bit and got more responses to that email than any email she'd ever sent before. That's not uncommon. You would think that the content that you would share that get the most um, hits and shares and likes and saves would be the 15 ways to do this thing, a kind of how-to. But it's usually the rants. It's usually the, the you finally... Uh, get something off your chest that was going to have you explode if you didn't. And what happens is everybody else was the same thing on their chest. It's like, oh, yes, thank you for saying it because they were too scared to say it. They're just glad that somebody had the courage to say it. 
I was talking with a friend of mine who's uh, deep in the conspiracy world, and he would share things from time to time. He said the reason he shared it, because he would get attacked, of course, whenever he'd share one of these outrageous ideas. But he would get secretly a lot of messages from people saying thank you, people who had never liked or commented on the post. Right. Who he didn't even realize were out there, but people who, when they saw it, like, thank you for saying it. I thought it was crazy. I thought I was the only one who saw this. It's so important what you're doing. So even if you don't see the evidence that there's a lot of people who are also seeing it, the reason you're not seeing them is because you haven't said something yet. And it's in saying it that these people often appear. And yes, you will lose people. Uh, and there will be people who come at you and, 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 uh, but you'll, you know, you're going to lose the people who you probably didn't want in the first place. Now, there's two axes of this. I just did a, a series of three videos on this. Of like, should I share this point of view? And so if you can imagine one axis is just, uh, is this important to them? Like, is this relevant to them? Do they actually care about this? The other axis is, do I want to share this? Is this important to me? So like, do they want to hear it? Do you want to share it? Um, of course, the part we're going for is stuff that we want to share that they want to hear. And there's some stuff that you may not want to share though it might be very relevant. You know, these are the dangerous ideas that we might share. And the reason you don't want to share it, it's not that you don't think it's important, it's that you're scared of the consequence. So you're like, I don't want to speak up about that. And it's just worth considering that quadrant. You don't want to share it, but they really want to hear it. Um, consider just giving that a bit more room than you had in the past, a little more consideration than you had. If you are scared to share it, there are other people who are scared to share it too. And everybody's waiting for somebody to go first. And if you will go first, it does give you a distinctive advantage of leadership in the marketplace because now you're the one that broke the story. You're the one that said the thing. You, you are demonstrating courage and leadership, which will have people get behind you. Again, you will be attacked, but you'll also be protected. Um, I think of a woman, Alison McDowell, who writes a lot about technology. She has a great blog, uh, Wrench in the Gears. And she writes about sort of uh, technocracy, transhumanism, colonization, race, beautiful stuff. And when she started speaking out about what she was seeing in this kind of technocratic fascist um, oncomingness of you know this fourth industrial revolution, great reset, whatever you want to call it, she started speaking up about it. And she thought her friends on the left, of course, would be right there with her and they couldn't have given less of a shit. And she realized her crowd became holistic practitioners and Christians, hmm. which wasn't, you know, if I, if we'd done a market analysis of who are your people, she would have said, well, lefties, great. What's the content we can put out that's going get, to get you some lefties? And, and she could have done that, but she was just sharing the truth. She was sharing things that she was maybe a little scared to share that lost her most of her community, yeah. caused immense trouble in her life. And yet, built this uh, very loyal, passionate following of people who are so glad that she's speaking out. So whether it's left or right or, or religious or not, if there are things in your community that are, that are bullshit, that are hypocritical, those are the things that people are desperately wanting somebody to speak out about. You probably covered this in the video and we could link to it as well in the podcast description, but how do you know when you're talking about the quadrant, what people want to hear? That's a great question. Well, you know, a lot of it is going to be based on, is it relevant for why they're coming to you? So if they're coming to you for back pain mm -hmm. and you have things to say about back pain, they just want to hear it. They kind of want to hear anything about back pain. And uh, what they don't necessarily want to hear is, I don't know, maybe your political beliefs they don't care about. Yeah. Uh, maybe they're, they don't want to hear about your, your cat or maybe a little bit, you know, sure. it's like they don't mind you. that. Yeah. They don't mind it being peppered in, uh, but they may not want to have that be the whole message. And so you can see where some people do this is they overshare on stuff that's just not relevant to why their people came. Right. And it becomes like, uh, there's other channels where I can just get the thing I want. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, it kind of equivalent of, I can go to Netflix and not get the commercials. So I can go to this other person and I'm not getting 
a million photos of their cat and them talking about their religious beliefs. Now, this is the the trouble because it may be one of these things where it's like, you know, I have these religious beliefs, but I actually don't want to share them. It's just not relevant. I don't care. And they don't care. Right. It's you know, we just don't talk about that. And it might be that that feels very important for you to share. I've known coaches. I've had so many Christian uh, clients. It's it's interesting. And they come and they're there's often a pattern of they're hiding their Christianity even though it's vital to them and actually has a, a kind of relevance to the work and their point of view about the work, but they don't want to share it. And when I, I just start to invite the possibility, like, what if you did, what if this became a key point? Oh my God, they're so relieved. And what do you mean I could share this? And they start to see how they can build a business with that more at the forefront because they want to share it. Now there will be certain people who don't want to hear it, but the idea is also, if you really want to share it, there will be some people who want to hear it. Now, are there enough? We're going to want to hear this thing. You'll find out. Yeah. Will there be some people? Almost certainly. Yeah. And I want to go on to read one of your quote unquote rants on your LinkedIn page. Cause it's actually kind of connected to what we're talking about right now, but I kind of want to stay on, the last subject, just for one more question, because I personally struggle with this, and maybe you, dear listener, do as well. Um, what happens when you have a, a staunchly held belief, and you have it for you know several years, and then you just completely radically change your mind on the topic? And uh, you know, I've done I've done this quite a few times in my life. Um, just speaking of like thinking of diet, you know, I was a, a vegan for a, a few years, and you know what I mean. And then later on, totally changed and. Um, now you have a record online of speaking directly about this. You're very passionate about this particular topic and then you just change your mind. Is there a, a tactical way that you might go about like re-engaging with the world and <laughs> saying maybe I was wrong or what are your thoughts on changing your mind? I, well, I mean, first of all, of course, I admire it when anyone changes their mind. This is one of the deep moments to give somebody a deep bow you know, and, and you take off your hat. It's a, it's a big deal. It's one of the hardest things in the world to have one's mind be changed. Yeah. I mean, and is it us that changes our mind or is our mind changed on our behalf by the world? I don't know how the mechanism, but I do know that we fight tooth and nail to prevent. So that's the first thing. Um, I think there should just be accolades uh, all around when people are, are willing to change their mind in whatever direction that people are just willing to reconsider based on the evidence. Um, so there's that. <clears throat> Second is it's a good reminder to just uh, maybe speak with some care and an acknowledgement that maybe this thing that we believe so fiercely right now, we might change our mind on later too. Yeah. So it's, it can be helpful just to say, you know, to frame things in a kind of, well, this is what I've come to. Yeah. This is what makes sense to me right now. And to speak in those ways that wouldn't um, make our future self uh, life difficult yeah. uh, unduly. But <laughs> uh, but if you find yourself in that situation, like, right, because I'm, yeah, I was vegan for 15 years. And, uh, oh, wow. Oops. <laughs> yeah. Long, and, much longer um, than me, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, there's a number of things. It, first of all, sometimes it's just not that relevant to you know, what we're talking about, we don't need to, yeah, it's like you're, I don't know, you're, a, you coach people in their finances used to be vegan, you're not anymore, your people may not even care or need to know. But if it's at the forefront, you're a nutritional person, and you're talking about, you know, vegan diet, and now you're a carnivore diet proponent. Uh, yeah, some of your people, it's just if it's probably going to come out anyways, mm -hmm. I think it is better to put your best foot forward and just let people know here's why. I mean, this is one of these things where you write a big piece or you do a big video where you lay out the reasons. And but it, and this is done out of respect for your your the people listening to you, where you say, look, um, something's changed and it may change your relationship to me. And I just want to put all the cards on the table so that you can make the best choice uh, for you about what, how you want to engage with me and my work, if at all. And you know, here's the unsubscribe button, really big, 
really evident. You may want to unsubscribe after you hear this. And if you do, you know, bless you. Uh, and here's why. Here's where I was. Here's where I am now. This is the logical chain uh, or series of situations that got me here. And, you know, there's going to be a bit of a purge at that point. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is, again, we have this kind of catastrophizing where it's, if I share this, it's going to be the worst thing ever. But again, it's worth asking what's the best that can happen and to know that the worst almost never happens. People are so scared if I share this, it's going to be terrible. And it's rarely as bad as people think. Yeah. It's really rarely as bad. And if people get vicious, you can just block people. I mean, that's what the block button is for. When people become vicious and start trolling, blocked. Done. That is a great answer. Thanks, Tad. Mm. Um, all right. So let's move on to that rant I was talking about. There's actually two if there's time, but we'll see how it rolls. In the meantime, I think this one is... A uh, nice dovetail. And um, I'm not going to read the whole thing. So again, go follow Tad on LinkedIn. And you start by saying, stop trying to be so authentic. I see a lot of folk. Sorry. I see a lot of this in the holistic scene. Folks trying to be so authentic and present and it comes across as forced, which it is. Just focus on enjoying people and life. Focus on getting to the truth of it, of if there's a fit between you. Focus on seeing if you can help them without assuming you can. Authenticity is the fruit of this. And then you go on, but just wondering, wondering if you could expound upon that. Yeah, you know, it's just, it was like an old man, Hargrave, being frustrated with the world um, and seeing so many people where there's this kind of authenticity sounds like this. And I'm just so present. And if you notice, I'm not even blinking, you know. <laughs> I'm just so here, yeah, with you, you know, and somebody asks a question, it's just, hmm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See how present and tuned into my body I am. And there's, there's just a way that it, it felt performative to me. It didn't feel real. Um, it felt overly sincere. And, and not, I mean, I shouldn't be so cranky about it in some ways because people are, are trying something different you know they're trying to actually they are trying to tune in to what's happening to them and there is a way where you know you get some people who are really trying to do it and other people who are just mimicking what they see and like oh that's authenticity authenticity looks like this and so then they mimic a certain a certain tone of voice mm, yeah and certain and because somebody who they find authentic sounds like that. So now they're going to sound like that. But by copying, you just automatically lose the authenticity. Right. And this idea that authenticity is a thing you can go for directly. And I don't think you can go for authenticity directly. I think if your aim is, I'm trying to be authentic, um, what you're aiming at is the performance. You know, it, what you're really aiming at is how do I come across as authentic? Um and it's much better, I think, just to focus on the truth. Like, I'm just going to say the truth. I'm going to say the honest thing. Uh, and in terms of marketing, I'm going to focus on the truth of, is this a fit or not? That's where my attention is going to be. I, I, if you could imagine it like authenticity is kind of appearing authentic, landing to other people in an authentic way is the trophy. And, but if you're in an archery contest and you're trying to hit the bullseye while staring at the trophy, you miss the bullseye and you don't get the trophy. And now, I mean, you could say that the, um, the trophy is coming across as authentic and the target is really authenticity and fine. I just noticed that people seem, authenticity becomes a buzzword it becomes a trend. It becomes, a, oh, yeah, I got to be authentic without the heavy lifting of what that really requires, which is to go back to the last conversation, saying the scary thing can be a very authentic thing. Like, hey, I, you know, I'm no longer vegan and uh, I don't want to tell you this because I'm scared what it's going to do to my business, but I feel like you need to know. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finally put it out so that I'm not withholding anymore. I'm not keeping my 
cards so close to my chest that prevent you from making a decision you might need to make. Um, so to me, that the focus needs to be on caring for the other person, caring for ourselves, focused on the truth. And authenticity will come out of that. But it's not a it's not a single button I think we can push of here's my authentic thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, being behind the mic, being in front of a camera now, uh, this is kind of it was foreign to me. And huh. I'm kind of learning as I go. And, you know, I've shared with the Herb Rally community my struggles like mental wellness and stuff like that. And every time I do, I'm like there is a selfish component to it because I feel like I'm putting it out there to help my seal, help myself. Like, I don't know, like maybe, maybe just putting it out in the world makes me feel a little more empowered by it. Um, and then yeah, yeah. the other, on the other end of the spectrum, I'm also getting positive feedback in the sense where people are saying, thanks for, you know, destigmatizing talking about it. So I feel like it's a, borderline public service in that, in that sure. uh, perspective. Um, and sometimes after, after I say it on the show, which I'll probably do it when I'm editing this video, I'll, I'll kind of cringe and be like, why did I say that? And like that, maybe that's TMI and maybe I'm trying to be too authentic. And just this whole conversation kind of makes me think about that. In the end, I'll probably keep maybe on occasion peppering it in just because I think it's helpful for me and p perhaps helpful for, for a handful of people out there. Um, I, I, can genuinely tell you i'm not trying to do it i'm not trying to make people feel sorry or anything like that but it's it's just kind of top of mind so i thought i'd bring that up yeah it's i hear you it's i think part of authenticity is that we yeah if you're standing in front of a room of people and you feel nervous it's better to just name it that you feel nervous. Why? Because everybody sees it. Yeah. Everybody right. sees that you feel nervous. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes I would start workshops and I would, I just can't find the beginning. I can't find where to start. And I remember one time in Toronto, I just looked up and I just said, this is just going to be an awkward rambling shambles of a beginning for the first 10 minutes. I was like, I'm not shit. This is going to be great. There's going to be notes everywhere. And you, but this is just going to be a rough beginning. I can tell. <laughs> so uh, what brings you, you know, I, and it was just, I could tell that I didn't have it. And if I pretended to have it, um, I just wasn't going to. And so I, if there are things that stop us from being present uh, and have us be off rhythm all the time, that has enormous consequences. And so it's often better to just say the thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the thing I don't want to share. That's having me feel everything is forced. Uh, you know, put it on the table. And now we can move forward. Uh, yeah, and I it really, it may just be that I'm too cranky about the, <laughs> the, uh, the authenticity thing. I, I just have seen what feels performative to me. Yeah. And I've seen it enough that it seemed like it was something worth commenting on. Yeah, we're here for a good tad rant. And you know what? We're both getting becoming old men, so it's all oh good. <laughs> um, let's do one more of your rants from the LinkedIn. And um, I don't know if you'd consider this one a, a rant or not, but uh, here we go. If you're niching around your wound and helping those in a situation you used to be in, then what does a sales letter become? An exercise in memory. As you write, you are remembering what it was like to be them. A sales letter becomes a love letter, a love letter to who you used to be. Yeah, I'm happy with that one. That was a good one. Yeah, goosebumps. Yeah. <laughs> it's it, it feels so true. You know, this is if for so many people, there it's just that ends up being their niche. Is um, you know, it's a Jeffrey Van Dyke's line that our deepest wounds are often a doorway to our truest niche. It's the wounded healer archetype. Hmm. And it really does change marketing for people because instead of it's, oh, here's a target market that I don't know anything about, but I'll do some research and then I can write a good sales letter, you know, that's very hard. But if you are marketing to people in the same position that you used to be in, it's really easy to do. 
because it's not an act of imagination. It's an act of memory. Yeah. You just have to sit down like, wow, what was it like? How did it feel? What was I saying to myself? And speak to that. What was I wanting most? And then, you know, I, I, when I talk to people who are, who've niched in that way and I ask them like, what, what was it you wanted? What was it that you, if somebody could have come up with a perfect offer for you, then what would it have been? People know mm. people can come up with that stuff so fast. And so then just like there are other people who see the bullshit that you see, there are other people who've gone through the experiences you've gone through and having gone through it gives you this insider status of knowing something that an outsider wouldn't know and so you can design an, an offer that those people would absolutely love that an outsider couldn't design uh you know they wouldn't they just wouldn't understand so yeah i recommend it for most people over coaches and in the healing arts to do some real deep thinking on what is it that you've overcome that you could help other people overcome what's what have been the deepest struggles in your life that you're on the other side of now that you have something to say about and consider weaving uh if not your entire business at least one of your offers around that uh, and you might be surprised how much easier it is how much a better response you get uh, how easy it is to articulate your opinions and to craft the offer itself mm -hmm. yeah it's especially relevant to our audience because you know when I interview herbalists, a lot of them, I'll, I'll ask them how they became an herbalist. And, you know, half the time they're saying, oh, I, I struggled with this illness. So this is why I, I wanted to heal myself. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, a um, couple more questions for you, Tad. But first, before we get into those, just curious if you wanted to, like, chat about any upcoming projects or anything you're excited about that you'd want to share with the Herbrelli audience. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, actually, Bradley Morris and myself are leading a workshop. If you go to magicmedia.com slash signature dash workshops, workshop, and it's M-A-J-I-K for magic. Okay. Um, but for most service providers, uh, there's one strategy I recommend way above uh, every other one. And this, uh, I came to this conclusion independently from Bradley and at a party on Salt Spring, we realized we had the same idea. And so we're putting this training together. Mostly he's leading it. But here's the here's the pitch for the, the approach. There's just nothing better as a service provider for marketing than getting in front of a group of people and talking about what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most people will attest to this, that they've had the experience. I mean, you speak at a... a some holistic fair or you speak at the local organic grocery store and people come and the people who come and listen to you buy or you're at a party and somebody says tell me about what you do and they really give you space to get into it the you know the magic of these plants or this particular tincture and people buy yeah. so getting in front of people and just talking about what we do is the thing and the so there's this idea of a signature workshop which is uh, you know if we're talking online it's an hour long and it's something that you would get other people to host because one of the mistakes people make is they're only marketing to their list, but your list at a certain point has heard all the stuff. Right. They're tired of it. So you've got to reach a fresh audience. So this is the idea of being hosted by somebody else. And they would bring you in, host you, bring their people to the talk, and you share, here's my core approach. And there's four parts to the signature workshop. First, you share your story. You know, here's what got me to this place where I have something to say about this topic. Now, of course, I mean, the very first thing is you got to figure out what the topic of the signature workshop is. Um, Cause it's gotta be something that people would want to come to. I mean, if it's just health 101, that's not as compelling as herbalism 101, which is not as compelling as, uh, oh man, who was it? There was a, an herbalist. Oh yeah. She, her, her niche was Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Mm. That was her specialty as an herbalist, you know, so like herbalism for Hashimoto's thyroiditis 101 is a much more compelling thing than health 101. So you got to figure out what's the topic, what's the hook, what's the thing that people would actually want to, oh yeah, I want to inconvenience my life to go to this. But then you got to share your story of like, why should I listen to you? That isn't in an hour, it's maybe five minutes at the most, <laughs> but basically you share three things, your low point, your turning point, and your high point. 
you know, um, the low point is like, this was, I got sick from this disease. Um, the turning point is the, aha, I discovered plants. I discovered herbs, you know, I got off the meds and I tried these plants and things actually started working and changing for me. Um, and then the high point is, and now I'm disease free and here I am and I've been healthy for years. Uh, so that's the first part. And then the next part, which is probably in my mind, the biggest chunk is you share your point of view. And this is the 30,000 foot view. This is my take on how you get from island A to island B. You're sick with this condition, you wanna be well, here's, here's how you do it. And again, this is very big picture. You just don't have enough time to get into the nitty gritty, but it's like, here are the core elements at play. Here are the big steps that need to be done. Here are the core ideas, however you wanna go about it. You, you know, you share that for maybe 20, 30 minutes. Third, you give them some experience, some aha, and that could be a journaling exercise, could be a visualization, could be, um, sometimes it's a story that you have that's just such a compelling story that it always wows people. It could be a physical exercise you have people do with you, um, stand up, move around, do this thing. But something that has them say, oh, wow, I get it. Uh, and then fourth is you just, there's the, what Bradley calls the call to adventure. It's the shameless plug. It's the commercial. It's the, here's what I've got that might help you. So if you can create an hour long version of that and just start touring it, it will do more for your business likely than anything else uh, I can say. Uh, so that's coming up. And then also in my membership. Yeah. If you go to marketing slash membership, um, You'll see, or marketingforhippies.com slash events. I think you scroll down, you'll see it uh, soon anyways. We've got our hub marketing semester. And hub marketing is this idea of very connected to the signature workshops, but a little bit bigger picture of the mistake people make in their marketing. I think most people, when they th there's three levels of marketing. There's kind of a cold, warm, and a hot level. On the cold level, you're just talking to strangers who don't know anything about what you do. And that doesn't work very well, talking to strangers. The warm level is the hub level where you start to um, approach people who are connected to your people, build those relationships, and they introduce you to their people like uh, a signature workshop that hosts you, bring their people to it. And the hot level is you've now become a hub and you're getting a lot of word of mouth and the marketing is way less effort because you have a reputation. So the main thing is we've got to stop the cold approaching, the cold calling, the, the cold emails. It just doesn't work very well. And we got to start building relationships and community. we got to start partnering with people and not being so lonely in our marketing, mm -hmm. developing relationships with other hubs who are connected to our people, which of course presupposes you have some sense of who your people are. Um, so I have a whole semester, there's three months where we dive deep, deep, deep into hub marketing and looking at referral systems, how to identify your hubs, how to approach them. Anyways, those are my commercials. Thank you very much. <laughs> And Tad did not pay me for that segment. No, I, I highly recommend Tad's work. I've I've spent many a time, much time on his website. He's got so many offerings as well as free offerings as well. But again, I highly encourage you to check out Tad's YouTube page as well. And uh, so, when is that um, that other course again coming up? The one that you're co-hosting with uh, was it Magic? Magic Media, yeah, Magic. Uh, with Bradley Morris, uh, September twelfth, I believe it's or September twelfth or sixteenth. that starts, yeah. Perfect. Well, uh, we will, we're going to have this already up to, uh, this episode up in the next, within the next week or so. So there'll be plenty of time to sign up and I'll challenge you. If you do sign up for this workshop with magic media and Tad, uh, email me Mason at herbrelli.com. Maybe we could host your hour long special somewhere on the, say on the podcast or the YouTube channel. And I think that'd be really fantastic. Cause that's what, that's what herb rally's role is here. We want to like help spread the word of all the incredible herbalists out there doing all the, all the work that you're doing. So, well, uh, let me, let me give yeah. a, a, a a counter pitch is that sure. what you might encourage people to do is to bring uh you can get five or six people to bring a 10 minute version of it mm, that's cool you know a, like a kind of micro presentation of here's my story here's the pithy point of view this is my main take here's a very brief exercise you can do um you know here's here's a 30 second commercial uh that's but you might get a lot of people to do it which is and this is the toughest thing Writing long things is easy. Writing short things, that's hard. To really figure out what's the point, to get to the point, that's so much of the work of marketing is the very simple questions like, what do you do? Who do you do it for? Those are really simple questions, but they're not easy to answer. 
back when I was working in marketing at the Mount, at Mountain Rose Herbs, I feel like a lot of people, like employees, internal employees, really despised writing their own bio, bios because it's like, how do I condense my, you know, professional and my personal life into a paragraph? But that's what that reminds me of. Well, you know, and that that speaks to this thing. It's worth saying is self promotion is kryptonite for most humans. Mm -hmm. If you're a healthy human, the self promotion thing is. Unless we're doing it kind of in a funny, tongue-in-cheek, playful way right. where we don't really mean it. But, you know, it's like, I'm the best and here's why I'm the greatest, you know. Yeah. Um, it's it's a kryptonite. For most of us, this self-promotion doesn't feel great. That's that's the weakness. But then the superpower, of course, is we're great at promoting other people. Yeah. And so then mar what does marketing become? It becomes making it easy for the people who love you to spread the word about you. Yeah. Um, so just for anyone, if you feel bad, like, oh, I should be better at self-promotion, that's a thought worth questioning. It's just like, who told you that? Who told you that this is supposed to come easily and naturally to you? Because it doesn't for most humans that I know. And we might as well cooperate with the inevitable and stop trying to gaslight ourselves that this is supposed to feel wonderful. Mm. Self-promotion very rarely feels wonderful. It usually feels a bit awkward. Uh, and it feels much better if somebody does it for us. Absolutely. You know? Yes, absolutely. Well, as I was saying, I, I do have more questions for you. Maybe we'll do a round three at some point. That'd be awesome. I, I, I figure this could be answered within the next few minutes. Um, and okay. it kind of connects nicely to the, the class that you're hosting with Magic Media. Um, how does one find what they might want to make their hour long presentation on? Because, you know, you start, obviously, you don't want to do herbalism 101. I know me personally, probably what I would want to do. And I, it's like that feeling that like burning desire inside, like, oh, I want to, re I really want to share this with the world. Just kind of curious if you have any tips or tricks if someone doesn't have like that immediate obvious thing that they might want to share. If somebody doesn't know what the topic is, there's a good chance they don't know what their niche is more broadly. Mm. So that's the first thing is, is there any sense of, of a niche? Mm -hmm. Now, I will say if you live in a small town, and you're one of the only herbalists there. Herbalism 101 could be the thing. I mean, maybe just nobody knows about it. Good point. My, my main point is if you're picking something that's like, we've heard it before, like weight loss 101, we've all been to that workshop. We've all right. heard that <laughs> workshop. So there's probably just gonna need to be a fresh angle. But number one, the wound is niche thing is where I would start. Um, and often that's enough. Often the fact that you are being invited by somebody is the thing that gets you there, uh, not just the topic. It's like, oh, this person thinks it's worthy, so I'll come. And if it's in the ballpark, we'll, we'll show up. Um, but also you can ask yourself, okay, well, there's two ways to do a signature workshop. One is just a 30,000 foot view, you know, Herbalism 101. Uh, the second is you pick a very specific subset. So let's say I might realize, oh, entrepreneurs, well, so yeah, entrepreneurs struggle with their niche. That's one of the main things that holds them back. So I could do the ethical marketing 101 workshop, which is my signature workshop. And I could say, you know what, I'm just going to start with the niching thing. I'm going to do a workshop, but the key is this. So if people go to marketingforhippies.com slash steps, they'll see a pyramid, five levels, I call them the five fundamentals. If you go with, um, So it, my signature workshop right now talks about all five in equal measure. But if I were, I could do the niching thing. And if I did that, I'd still want to show the whole pyramid. I'd still want to say, look, there's five things you need to handle. Here's the niche. Here's where it fits. Um, we're going to talk about that today, but you do need to handle the other things. You've got to give people the rest of the context. But you might start with what's the biggest presenting problem? What's the most urgent thing? Ah, my people are way too busy. They're so overwhelmed. So I'm going to do a workshop first on how to free up your time, how to create more space in your life, even though it's health coaching or relationship coaching or financial coaching. I'm realizing that people don't even have time or space to breathe enough to focus on this work. So I'm going to create a, a workshop on that. You could do that. My bias is to do the signature workshop focused on the 30,000 foot view. Because I think when people come they really want to know just who are you? What's your take on this? Do I want to invest further with you? At some point that view uh, has to come in. 
Amazing. Pat Hargrave, thank you so much for joining the Herb Rally podcast once again. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. That's marketingforhippies.com. All links to everything we chatted about will be in the YouTube description, podcast, show notes, etc. So awesome, Tad. Well, this has been a blast. We'll talk to you very, very soon. All right. All right. Take care, man. Yeah, take care. Bye, everybody.